Welcome to Class 3, uh, Chapter 3, Art of Ancient Egypt. So for today's class, you can go ahead and uh, go to the video that is linked here on this screen, but you can find the link in the notes to this YouTube video. Um, this is about art repatriation. Art repatriation is the return of art or cultural objects, usually referring to ancient or looted art, to their country of origin or former owners or their heirs. Watch the video and then go ahead um, as we go through ancient Egypt, ancient Egyptian art, and think about, um, again, that conflict between whether to remove objects from their uh, natural or cultural home to a, quote, safer space uh, in the West, or to keep them in places like Turkey, Greece, Italy, and uh, the Middle East. So what do you think of when you think of ancient Egypt? When you hear ancient Egypt, most people think pyramids, mummies, Cleopatra, King Tut, maybe Queen Nefertiti, and definitely hieroglyphics. Ancient Egypt's impact on later cultures is immense and cannot be understated. While all cultures influence and share from others when contact is made between them, Egypt's continuity and power influenced the Greeks, Romans, and in turn, all Western civilization. Likewise, those in the East who had contact with the Egyptians took what they saw and traded and brought it into Turkey, the Middle East, and even further. We will see popes borrowing Egyptian imagery, our founding fathers, and still today, on our money, one can find influences of ancient Egyptian symbolism. In the upper left corner, you'll see an image of an obelisk in Rome. This was taken by the Pope from ancient Egypt. And hopefully everyone recognizes the monument um, in the center of the screen, which is of course the Washington Monument in DC. When you think of ancient Egypt, think of longevity. Ancient Egyptian civilization lasted for more than 3,000 years and showed an incredible amount of continuity. To put that in perspective, Cleopatra VII's reign, so the Cleopatra we know and love, her reign ended in 30 BCE, before the Common Era. Her reign is closer to our own time than it was to the construction of the pyramids of Giza. Ancient Egyptian Consistency and Stability Compared to other civilizations which were cropping up at the time, like those in the ancient Near East, we saw, which saw an incredible amount of changing culture, religion, and power over a 3,000 year span, ancient Egypt was incredibly stable. The oldest Egyptian royal monuments, like this palette, show the exact same royal garb and stance which would be used by Ptolemaic kings nearly 3,000 years later. Ancient Egyptian Beliefs About Imagery Images had a spiritual but literal function outside themselves. The strong belief that an image could function as person, action, ritual, this caused a resistance to stylistic change. For instance, tomb scenes of the deceased receiving food or temple scenes of the king performing perfect rituals for the gods, those images were literally causing those things to occur in the divine realm according to ancient Egyptian belief. If the image of the bread loaf was omitted from the deceased table, they had no bread in the afterlife. If the king was depic depicted with the incorrect ritual implement, the ritual was incorrect and this could have dire consequences. This belief led to an act of resistance to change in codified depictions, because if they messed up, it might have an effect in the afterlife. Like the Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, an enormous, powerful river was essential for ancient Egypt's development. This was, of course, the Nile. The ebbing and flowing of the river created some of the most fertile land in the world. It was so predictable on a yearly basis that the Egyptian calendar and seasons were based on the river's movements. The Nile is also the longest river in the world, 
It starts deep in Africa and empties into the Mediterranean Sea. The Nile River, when it flooded, created a sharp delineation between fertile and desolate. The Egyptians referred to this as Kemet, the Black Lands. And you can see here in this image, right where the floodplain stops. All of that fertile green turns into desert. Now moving into pre-dynastic Egypt. Unification in Egypt marks the beginning of the dynastic periods, so called by modern scholars. Until then, from about 5000 BCE, there had been groups settled in the Nile Delta, usually referred to as pre-dynastic Egypt. These groups migrated there during the Paleolithic and Neolithic times, from deep in the heart of Africa, following the Nile to settle in the fertile lands at the Delta. This is a good time to point out that ancient, that ancient Egypt is an African civilization, made by African people. Eventually, Egypt would become a veritable melting pot of Sub-Saharan Africans, North Africans, Mesopotamians, and eventually Greeks and people from the Mediterranean. But the pharaohs were, for a large part, black Africans. The Pharaoh, Divine Kingship in Ancient Egypt The divine aspect of the office of kingship was what gave authority to the human ruler. The living king, or pharaoh, was associated with the god Horus, the powerful, virile, falcon-headed god who was believed to bestow the throne on the first human king. Pharaonic portraiture was to show divine kingship, not individual features or distinctive body shapes. The Purpose of Ancient Egyptian Art Statuary provided a place for the recipient to manifest and receive the benefit of ritual action. Most of the art was not meant to be seen, but rather they were designed to benefit a, dis a divine or deceased recipient. Statuary typically served as an intermediary between humans and the gods. Statuary, whether divine, royal, or elite, provided a kind of conduit for the spirit, or ka, of that being to interact with the terrestrial realm. Family chapels with the statuary of a deceased forefather could serve as a sort of family temple. Preserved letters let us know that the deceased was actively petitioned for their assistance, both in this world and the next. The Palette of Narmer is one of the oldest historical artworks preserved. There is an incredibly high level of craftsmanship presented here, but interpretation of its meaning is tricky. It's an elaborate, formalized version of a utilitarian object commonly used in the pre-dynastic period to prepare eye makeup. This piece is important because it creates the stylistic conventions Egyptian will use for millennia. This object is about two feet high. The Palette of Narmer was discovered in 1898. It was found with a collection of other objects that had been used for ceremonial purposes and then ritually buried within the temple at Hierakonpolis. What do we see on the front? Starting at the top, Narmer's name written with symbols of a catfish and chisel within a palace. There's a boat. There are foes decapitated and castrated. At the bottom, we see what may represent the king as a bull knocking down the walls of a city. There's a mythical animal with entwined necks defining a recess for mixing makeup. We see a priest wearing a leopard skin following four divine standards. We see King Narmer with a sandal bearer behind him, wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt and a bull tail and a kilt known as the Lower Egyptian costume. We also see the head of the goddess Bat, or the goddess Hathor. What do we see on the back? There's a falcon with a human arm. It could be the god Horus, shown holding a rope binding a foe's head. An important foe. There's dead foes within a walled city, perhaps a, a personification of cities. We have Narmer, wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt, a bull tail, royal beard, and a kilt associated with the goddess Bat. There's a sandal bear. And lastly, the mace pose, used for the next 3,000 years, also referred to as the smiting pose. So what do you think the possible interpretations of the Narmer palette could be? The unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, the general timeline, and this could be an actual or symbolic representation of unification of Upper and Lower Egypt in general. We also see the sun and the king, the balance of order and chaos, Ma'at and Isfet, which is an idea fundamental to the Egyptian idea of the cosmos. 
This fascinating object is an incredible example of early Egyptian art. The imagery preserved on this palette provides a peek ahead to the richness of both the visual aspects and religious concepts that develop later on in ancient Egypt. It is a vitally important artifact of extreme significance for our understanding of the development of Egyptian culture on multiple levels. We're now moving into the Old Kingdom. The Great Pyramids at Giza are the last remaining of the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. It took humans 4,000 years to build something taller than the pyramids. They are thought to be a reference to the sun and the sun god Re, as he ascended into the sky to be reborn. The pyramid was considered a place of regeneration for the ruler. Each pyramid was part of a royal mortuary complex that also included a temple at its base and a long stone causeway, some nearly uh, a kilometer in length, leading east from the plateau to a valley temple on the edge of the floodplain. Smaller pyramids for queens were created as satellites for the major pyramids. Additionally, a royal court and elite person's cemetery was placed nearby with smaller tombs, known as mastabas, Arabic for bench, in reference to their shape, flat-roofed rectangular with sloping sides, that fill the area to the east and west of the Pyramid of Khufu. Who do you think this is? What can you say about his expression? Where do you think this statue might have been located? This is a statue called Khafra Enthroned. It is a portrait of Khafra from his pyramid complex. He is enthroned as divine ruler with a perfect body. He has a rigid pose which creates the effect of eternal stillness. Khafra Enthroned is a good early example of that consistency of style to show divinity and balance that was so important to the ancient Egyptians. The Seated Scribe most Egyptian sculpture was painted, but some was left its natural color of the stone to enhance the abstraction and timelessness of the statue. This is a statue of a scribe that was found at the necropolis in Sakra, Egypt. He would have originally held a pen. He was an object meant for the afterlife. Compare the sculptures of the seated scribe and Khafra enthroned. What is the same? A similarity might be that they both have a solemnity, there's a stillness, they're both seated, they're both sculpture. What is different? Notice the body type, the expression, the face, the material, the age. Something that you might notice right away is that Khafra was never painted. However, the seated scribe is painted. The seated scribe also has a more naturalistic look. He might not be an individual, but he certainly looks more human with his pudgy stomach and a slight smile. The idealism that characterizes the portraiture of Egyptian god kings did not extend to the portrayal of non-elite individuals. Idealism it's representing forms and figures to attain perfection based on pervading cultural values and or the artist's own personal ideals. So even if Khafra was maybe 50 or 60 when that statue was, was carved, he still would have been carved like a young god-king warrior. Realism, on the other hand, representing familiar things as they actually are. The First Intermediate Period the land was in a state of civil unrest and near anarchy. Art did not thrive during this period. For the Middle Kingdom, I invite you to go ahead and watch the video on the Blue Hippo. Only the wealthiest and noblest ancient Egyptians could afford tombs, but prosperous people could still commission funerary stelae depicting themselves and their family and offerings of food. These were monuments meant to preserve the memory of the deceased and inspire the living to make offerings to them. This stelae is unique because it is unfinished. It gives us an, a, a special glimpse into how the sculptor worked. We can see that he drew directly on the stone and was using a grid pattern to create his figures. Unfortunately, this stone cutter died before he finished his own funerary stelae, which is why it was left unfinished. In this other example of funerary stelae, you can see the amazing and vividly colored paintwork. 
This was common in a lot of Egyptian art, especially on walls of tombs and on funerary stelae such as this. Following the Middle Kingdom, we have the Second Intermediate Period. There's a Mesopotamian takeover of the Delta region. After the Syrians are kicked out, we come to the New Kingdom with the capital city of Thebes. This is the most brilliant period in Egypt's history. They expanded the Egyptian territory all the way into the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Egypt extended its borders by conquest from the Euphrates River in the east and deep into Nubia in the south. This royal mortuary temple was built for one of the most remarkable women in history, Queen Hetep's put. Possibly built by the royal architect and her lover, Senmut, it's incredibly well suited to its natural setting and includes colonnades, pillars, and terraces. Royal mortuary temples like this one had shrines providing the rulers with a place for worshipping their patron gods and then serving as temples in their honor after their death. Here is an illustration of how the Temple of Hachesput would have looked when it was built. The terraces, the terraces would have had gardens of frankincense trees and rare plants. The interior of her complex tells stories and reliefs of her divinity and right to rule. Most images of Hachesput have been destroyed. She became a pharaoh, not just a pharaoh's wife or mother. This is an important distinction. In the ancient Egyptian language, there is no female version of the word for pharaoh. She became pharaoh, not the pharaoh's wife or mother. She was not queen, she was king, she was pharaoh. What do you notice about the representation of her in this image? She's dressed in traditional pharaoh garb. She's wearing the pharaoh beard, the pharaoh crown, the pharaoh skirt. She's dressed as a man. The Temple of Ramses II in Abdu Simbel. This is from the 19th dynasty. Ramses was Egypt's last great warrior pharaoh, and he ruled for nearly 60 years, which is incredible given the life expectancy was probably close to 40 years old. These are colossal figures, nearly 65 feet tall but they lacked the refinement of earlier periods because of their size. Ramses honored the most important members of his family with large statues inside the structure. The Temple of Amun-Re. Now, it's in relatively poor condition, but its, immensely, but its immensity still provides scholars with a wealth of information about Egyptian life and art. The complex remains one of the largest religious complexes in the world. However, Karnak was not just one temple dedicated to one god. It held not only the main precinct to the god Amun-Re, but also the precincts of the gods Mut and Mantu. New Kingdom temple design was a big change from the Middle Kingdom. One of the most impressive features of the building complex is the Hypostyle Hall. Like most of the temple decoration, the hall would have been brightly painted and some of its paint still exists on the upper portions of the columns and ceilings today. With the center of the hall taller than the spaces on either side, the Egyptians allowed for celestatory lighting, a section of the wall that allowed light and air into the otherwise dark space below. Conceptually, temples in Egypt were connected to the idea of Zeptepi, or the first time, the beginnings of the creation of the world. Temples were representations of the cosmos, the creation of Earth, the divine. Amenhotep and the Amenara period. Amenhotep IV, or Akhenaten, he had massive religious change happening in Egypt. This is one of the only times we see an inconsistency in the style happening in ancient Egypt. This is also the time of Queen Nefertiti. Anemhotep later changed his name to Akhenaten and abandoned the worship of most of the Egyptian gods in favor of Aten, who he declared was the only and universal god. What do you notice about the style of this royal portrait? Think back to the portrait of Khafra. Here he is with Menkere from the Old Kingdom. Compared to the previous representations of pharaohs that we've seen, Akhenaten certainly has a curious body shape, with weak arms, a narrow waist, protruding belly, wide hips, and fatty thighs. It is extremely feminine. 
this is possibly a deliberate break from convention. It's possible that Akhenaten's artists tried to formulate a new androgynous image of the pharaoh as a manifestation of Aten, the sexless sun disk. Some have speculated that it was an actual deformity, but that is extremely unlikely. It is most likely that, due to Akhenaten's break with religious convention, he also wanted his artistic style to be drastically different from the Egyptians that had come before him. Tutankhamun and Ramses II returned to ancient Egyptian conventional style. Discovered in 1922 by Howard Carter, a British Egyptologist, Tut's tomb was never robbed, which is why it's left such a mark on us, though he only lived to be 19 and wasn't a major pharaoh. The Ptolemaic period. Alexander the Great was a Greek general who at this point had conquered most of the known world, though he never made it to India. His Greek general Ptolemy was put in control of Egypt. Cleopatra was Ptolemy's granddaughter. The Rosetta Stone is from this period. The Fayum mummy portraits, which are encaustic paintings that were wrapped around a mummy's body where their face would be, show an incredible mix of Egyptian stillness and solemnity with Greek realism. These hail from a point in Egyptian history during the reign of the Ptolemies, where Greeks and people from all over the Mediterranean, Africa, the Middle East, had come to Egypt to trade, to live, to work. Cleopatra's death in 30 BCE marks the end of ancient Egypt. If you'd like to read more about ancient Alexandria and Cleopatra herself, Stacy Schiff, I believe in 2007, wrote an excellent nonfiction book about Cleopatra.